services and lifetime career services. You're not waiting to win. You're ready to succeed again. Learn more at umgc.edu. Tonight on Closing Arguments, Johnny Depp walks away a winner from his U.S. defamation trial against ex-wife Amber Heard. But in 2020, he lost his U.K. legal battle. We take a look at the evidence that didn't make it in front of the jury in Virginia. My back has turned to him and I feel this boot in my back. It just kicked me in the back. Johnny Depp and Amber Heard both took the witness stand in this he said, she said, dueling defamation case. What was it that the jury saw in Johnny? Why did they believe him? Our experts weigh in. Mr. Depp, did you ever physically abuse Ms. Heard during your relationship? Never. Never. Johnny's friend and standout witness, Isaac Ike Baruch, took to Instagram after the verdict. We have his statement and a look back at some of his testimony. I'm looking at her forehead. I'm looking at the side of a uh, side of her eye. I'm looking at her cheek. I'm looking at the, her chin. I'm looking at the other side of the face. I'm looking at the whole thing. And I don't see anything. And the jury awarded Johnny Depp $15 million in damages and awarded Amber Heard $2 million. But how did they come up with the numbers? Buckle your seatbelts. This hour of Closing Arguments starts right now. Good evening and welcome to Closing Arguments. I'm Ted Rollins in for Vinny Politan. Tonight we begin tonight with breaking news in the Murdoch mystery saga that just keeps getting more complicated and more bizarre. Today, officials with the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division announced that they sought and received permission from the Satterfield family to exhume the remains of Alec Murdoch's former housekeeper, Gloria Satterfield. Satterfield died in 2018 in one of the Murdoch family homes from what was described as a trip and fall accident. Earlier this week, Murdoch admitted in a confession of judgment filing that he owes the sons of his late housekeeper more than $4.3 million. Alec Murdoch is accused of dozens of financial crimes as well as faking his own suicide for insurance money. And authorities are still investigating the murders of his wife, and son who were shot and killed in a different one of the family homes. It is a case that we have been following for months and months. Court TV legal correspondent has the background on this complicated case. We do believe that Mr. Murdaugh is a, uh, a danger. Um, he's, he's already, by the pre previous charges that he had, uh, he's been a danger to himself. And a man who's a danger to himself is a danger to others. Disgraced attorney Alec Murdoch was ordered held without bond after being arrested and charged with stealing millions of dollars in insurance money from the family of his longtime housekeeper. When a lawyer steals with a pen, it's just as bad as somebody who steals with a gun. Gloria Satterfield died after allegedly tripping and falling over the family dogs at the Murdoch South Carolina home. Prosecutors say Murdoch came up with an elaborate scheme to sue himself, then steal money from her wrongful death settlement. At the time of his arrest, Murdoch was out on bond, facing charges that he tried to arrange his own death. Hampton County 911, where's your emergency? Yes, um, we're on... Sakahatchee Road, and uh -huh. there is a man on the side of the road with blood all over him, and he's waving his hands. He just laying there, waving his hands around? Fine. He looks fine, but it kind of looks like a setup, so we didn't stop. Oh, I don't believe you. Prosecutors say it was a setup that Murdoch tried to get this man, Curtis Eddie Smith, to kill him so that the Murdoch's surviving son, Buster, could collect $10 million in life insurance. Murdoch has been under a cloud of suspicion since his wife and another son, Paul, were found shot to death. His attorney admits his client may be guilty of financial wrongdoing, but insists Murdoch had nothing to do with the deaths of his wife and son. He says Murdoch called 911 after discovering their bodies in the family's hunting lodge. I've been up to it now. It's bad. Okay. Oh. Okay, and are they breathing? No, ma'am. Okay, and you said it's your wife and your son? 
my wife and my son. For nearly a century, the Murdoch name has embodied a legacy of power and justice in South Carolina's low country. Here in the small town of Hampton, it's virtually impossible to find someone who does not know of the prominent legal family. But recently, the name has become synonymous with tragedy. At the time of his death, 22-year-old Paul Murdoch was awaiting trial, charged with three felony counts of voting under the influence for a 2019 crash that killed 19-year-old Mallory Beach. According to depositions taken in that case, Paul Murdoch illegally purchased alcohol at Parker's convenience store using his older brother's ID. Surveillance video shows him leaving the gas station, towing his father's 17-foot boat. As he exits the store, you can see him raise his arms in a triumphant gesture to his friends. After attending an oyster roast, the six friends headed by boat to a bar in downtown Beaufort, South Carolina. And later, Murdoch stumbles on the dock as he and his friends return to the boat around 1 a.m. Just over an hour later, the boat slammed into a bridge piling. And Connor Cook called 911. What bridge is it? Paul, what bridge is this? <laughs> Paul, what bridge? 911, where's your emergency? Hello? Police, fire, any nurse? Hello? We're in a boat crash on Arthur Street. There's six of us and one is missing. The body of Mallory Beach was found nearly a week later in a marsh about five miles from the crash scene. The charges against Paul Murdoch were dropped after his death, but the investigation is ongoing. And the case is ongoing and going and going. Uh, and today, another uh, fascinating development in this. Let's bring in someone who can help us navigate the significance of this. Erica Morse is a private investigator in Chicago, Illinois. And Erica, what's your first take here? Uh, Gloria Satterfield, yes, it was clear that authorities thought that Alec Murdoch used her death to basically make millions of dollars and not pay the kids, uh, the family. Uh, but now this is a whole nother um, scenario exhuming her body. What, what's your first um, instinct when you when you heard that news? Um, hey, um, when I heard it, it, it almost kind of became simple. I mean, it's standard operating procedure. This was changed to a criminal investigation late last year. Um, everywhere Alex Murdoch goes, there is death. Um, this is the fourth death surrounding him um, with 75 plus charges already, um, already on the table. And to go back and exhume a body is SOP when it was never done in the first place, when there was no autopsy conducted. You'll have to remember that Gloria Satterfield's death was wiped under the table, so to speak. Um, it was kept very quiet, a thorough examination and autopsy was not done. And therefore it, it makes perfect sense to go back to the very beginning and ensure that they understand fully what cause of death was and to make sure that nothing is missed in that process. In the, the family said she tripped over some dogs in the house and ended up perishing because of the result of those wounds sustained by falling down the stairs. If she were pushed down the stairs, if she if something else um, that corresponded to the basics of a staircase fall, which you'd think that's why they told the story in the first place, uh, there'd be no way would there to differentiate between an accidental fall or uh, something else. I mean, I'm not a forensic expert, nor do I claim to be, but there are ways. Um, you know, I see a lot of autopsy reports in my line of work, and there are ways to determine based on things like velocity, just the 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 way at which she fell, the rate at which she fell, was was she pushed? Was there extra energy there that made her go further, um, or was it a slight trip and fall that just resulted in a large trauma or injury to the head? Again, not claiming to be a forensic person by any means, but I work with some really good ones, so there are ways for them to measure. To 
to check um, the level of trauma. Are there abrasions? Are there signs of strangulation? Um, is there DNA under her nails? You know, again, forensic testing has has expanded and gets better every day. So there are tests available now that were not available when Gloria died. And I would expect that um, South Carolina law enforcement would do that. And kudos to them for going back and taking this step because that is how you get to the bottom of whether this is a foul play scenario or just a tragic accident. South Carolina um, law enforcement agency said and warned, you know, basically told people this is not going to be a process that happens overnight. It is going to take some time to exhume this body and then to your point, go in and analyze it to look for any clues. The only other potential sort of clue that we have in terms of something that was happening at the time was the 911 call that was made by Mrs. Murdoch. So this is after Gloria Satterfield supposedly falls down the stairs, trips over the family dogs, the st story that uh, the family gave law enforcement. And this is the call. We're going to play just a portion of it. And uh, we'll get your opinion, Eric, if you hear anything there, um, analyzing the voice of uh, this caller, which is Maggie Murda, who's now dead, but at the time makes the call about Gloria's fall. Listen. My housekeeper has fallen and her head is bleeding. I cannot tell get her up. Okay, you said she's fallen. She's bleeding from the head? Yes. Okay. How old is she? I'm not sure, like 58 maybe. Do you know if she fell from standing or not? No. No. Where'd she fall from? Uh, from the, she fell going up the steps, up the brick steps. Okay, so she out bed or inside? Outside. Okay. How many steps is there? Uh, eight. Okay, is she on the ground or is she up near the top? She's on the ground. She's on the ground. She's on the ground. Is she conscious? Uh, no, not really. Is she awake at all? Yes. Okay. Is she just not, like, responding appropriately, but she is awake? <laughs> Man, she's not, no, she's not responding. Okay, I just, I, I've already got them on the way. Me asking questions does not slow them down, ma'am. Um, Knowing if she's conscious is one of the things that the medic needs to know. If she's responding at really. all to you. No. Okay, so she's not responsive at all. Well, I mean, she's mumbling. Okay, so she is somewhat conscious. Erica, what do you hear in that 911 call? Um, almost a tad argumentative, which is, is kind of surprising. Um, just maybe irritated. Um, I mean, sure, it was a it was a difficult time, and we can never accurately gauge what someone's response in a crisis situation is going to be. And I do have to make that disclaimer here. However, I mean, certain things catch your attention. Who falls up the stairs? Um, when she was describing that, the first thing I wondered: concrete stairs, carpeted stairs. What's the setup of the stair of the stairwell itself? I actually watched someone um, trip over a laundry basket many, many years ago and fall down eight stairs uh, carpeted and hit her head hard but within a couple of minutes you know she kind of came to a little groggy um, a laceration bleeding from the head was that a hard push was that a trip we don't know yet um, that's what the ME will find out that's what things like you know toxicology maybe can can help us understand and then also again I would be looking for other abrasions lacerations elsewhere on the body uh, signs of a struggle any signs of strangulation and um, you know you're, you're just looking for in DNA under the fingernails um, if they were taken or if samples were ever taken we don't even know if we can get that yeah it's a fascinating development here um you don't hear a lot of empathy in that 911 call or uh even no the, like, the, the, there seems to be a no. detachment um there but to your point yes 911 calls there you cannot uh say oh this person should be acting in a certain manner uh bottom line is the um south carolina law enforcement division announcing today they are going to exhume the body of Gloria Satterfield um, as part of this ongoing in investigation. And at the center of all of these investigations is one guy, Alec 
Murdoch will continue to uh, follow this case. Uh, thank you, Erica Morris. Appreciate your insight, uh, helping us navigate what exactly this means. And I guess what it means is be patient because uh, this is going to be a long investigation. Coming up after the break, we're going to switch gears and talk about Johnny and Amber go into some evidence that was not seen in the U.S. version of the Johnny Depp versus Amber Heard case. And uh, would that have made a difference? Amber Heard's team has said publicly in these days after the verdict, uh, yeah, that, that's the problem here. They didn't get to hear everything. Well, what, what didn't they get to hear? We're going to talk about that next. Officially licensed everything. In civil case number CL 2019-2911, Mr. Depp's claim against Ms. Heard. One, as to the statement appearing in the online op-ed entitled Amber Heard, 
I spoke up against sexual violence and faced our culture's wrath. That has to change. In the Washington Post online edition, quote, I spoke up against sexual violence and faced our culture's wrath. That has to change, end quote. Do you find that Mr. Depp has proven all the elements of defamation? Answer, yes. Welcome back. We're turning our attention back to the Johnny Depp defamation case. Of course, on Wednesday, the jury sided with Johnny Depp on all three of his claims against his ex-wife, Amber Heard. They ended up awarding him $15 million. It was reduced down to just over 10. And the jury also awarded Amber Heard $2 million. The verdict was a much different outcome than the 2020 UK trial where Johnny Depp sued the Sun newspaper for calling him a wife beater. He lost that. Tonight, we were very excited. We were going to dive into the differences between London and the U.S. with Amber Heard's attorney, Elaine Bredehoff. But last minute, she bailed on an interview with our Chanley painter. We're hoping to talk to her early next week. She did talk about the differences, though, in the U.S. and the U.K. cases on the Today Show. We had an enormous amount of evidence that was suppressed in this case that was in the UK case. In the UK case, when it came in, Amber won, Mr. Depp lost. Technically, the son won, Amber didn't win, but um, what is this mountain of evidence that she's talking about? Well, we do know that some of it that wasn't allowed in the US trial included some text messages Following that flight from Boston to Los Angeles that both Johnny Depp and Amber Heard testified about and told very different stories about, well, Court TV's Julia Janae dug into that evidence and has more. Another perspective of the Boston plane incident was never seen by the jury. Documents obtained by Court TV reveal text messages exchanged just after that controversial trip. Exhibit number 229, entered as evidence in the libel case in the United Kingdom, was barred as hearsay from the Virginia trial. This text from Depp's phone to his then wife, Amber Heard, reads, once again, I find myself in a place of shame and regret. My illness somehow crept up and grabbed me. Heard alleges Depp kicked her during a vicious fight on that flight to Boston in May of 2014. I feel this boot in my back. He just kicked me in the back. No one said anything. No one did anything. It was like you could hear, you could hear a pin drop on that plane. You could feel the tension, but no one did anything. Depp denies ever physically assaulting his partner. I'm like sorry. He's sorry. He feels bad. Yes, because any other answer you know, uh, uh, it would turn into World War III. Heard's attorney aimed to discredit the movie star by presenting text messages like this one from Depp's personal assistant, Stephen Duders, to Amber Heard. It reads, hey, he's up, he's much better, clearer. He doesn't remember much, but we took him through all that happened. He's sorry, very sorry. Later, Duders writes, Depp was appalled when I told him he kicked you he cried. You asked Mr. Duders to communicate with her on your behalf, correct? Um, I don't know what you're talking about. After the Boston plane flight, you had Mr. Duders communicate with Miss Hurd, correct? When I'm asked what to do, I said placate her, just placate her like we always do. Duders never testified. So with Depp on the witness stand for the second time, Here's what happened when Amber Heard's defense attorney tried to show those texts from Depp's assistant to the jury. Your Honor, I think you know where I'm going here, and based on Mr. Depp's testimony, I'd ask him for the admission of Exhibit 229. Your Honor, I'd, can we please approach? Sure. After that sidebar, attorney Ben Rottenborn moves on, and those texts stay out of evidence. I knew that she would say that. I mean, I knew that she would say that she had issues with you know, him with drugs and alcohol. Depp's sister, Christy Dombrowski, who testified and sat in the gallery for closings, also fired away messages to her about the Boston incident. She urged the couple to work things out. Could be things get better from all of this. I want to help you both. Heard responds, sounding defeated. 
I'm not going to keep falling back into the same patterns that always repeat themselves. If he truly gets help, then I hope he would come to find me. Meanwhile, in a separate string of texts, Depp's messages sound first remorseful, then indignant that Heard hasn't returned his call. I'm out. I'm done. Her actions have added more drama than necessary. And when was I unhealthy exactly? When I was not sober for a day? I guess that's what people call falling off the wagon. It's happened to a lot of my friends. Their wives don't stop calling them. So the question tonight is, if those texts would have gotten into trial, um, the, and the herd team obviously wanted to get them in, thought they could get them in at one point in trial, would that have made a difference? Let's talk about it with our guests tonight. In Orlando, Florida, jury consultant and human behavior expert Susan Constantine, and in Woodlands, California, trial attorney Chris Melcher. Chris, to you first, the um, Elaine Bredehoff is, is basically making a big deal out of this now post-verdict saying, if we would have had these text messages in, this would have been a different outcome. Could this be part of the uh, appeal first off? And, and also, do you think it would have made a difference had the jury heard or wa read a text from Steven Duders, the assistant, that said, when I told him he kicked you, he cried? Would that have made a difference? I, I don't believe so. I mean, they're doing everything that they can to attack the legitimacy of this verdict. It was a six-week trial. It was very well conducted, a fair process to both sides. And there was a mountain of evidence, a lot of inconsistencies in Amber's testimony. She was on the stand for days. Her testimony was inherently incredible. So to think that one text message would have wiped away all of the inconsistencies, the doctored photos, the photo of her having a bruise one day and not having the bruise the next day, that there, it's, it's unbelievable to think that that one text would all of a sudden wipe all that away and make the jury magically believe her. Susan, it, it's one thing for the text message, because there were horrible text messages that were introduced at, at the trial here. Um, uh, but it's not as though Duders, the assistant, got up and said, I saw him kick her. Um, he was relaying possibly a message that she told him and said, hey, tell him he kicked me uh, when I, you know, so. That's different, is it not, these text messages, because we watched it all play out, and I know where you stand at all this. You watched them both very closely on the stand, and, and, and you were just like the jury. You picked one of them that was lying and the other one that wasn't. Um, what do you, what's your take on the difference between the text message and an actual witness, which they didn't have? Well, a witness absolutely has more credibility than one small text, and I agree with your other guests. 100 percent there was such a mountain of evidence against her we didn't need that text message but had there been a real person that was testifying who was credible who was believable and also had the credibility you know that some of the other witnesses did with the, on the death side then yes i think it would have mattered but not just this text message. I think that there was just way too much already against Amber Heard, and I don't think that it would have made any difference whatsoever. Hmm. Elaine Brenhoff uh, thinks differently, and again, we were hoping to have that Chanley Painter interview uh, to dissect this evening, but uh, as she had something come up, she said, at the last minute, and she's more than invited uh, here on Court TV next week. Hopefully, hopefully she will uh, take us up on our offer. Chris Melcher, thank you for uh, joining us tonight. Susan's going to stick around when we come back. It may have been Johnny Depp's testimony that swayed the jury. We're going to look back at that. Uh, or was it at the supporting cast? We'll talk more about that as well later. Stick with us.
9995. Never did I myself reach the point of um, uh, striking Miss Heard in any way, nor have I ever struck uh, um, any woman um, in my life. It changes your life forever. You never forget the first time someone hits you like that. Well, there were two high-profile witnesses with two completely different stories and it was up to the jury to decide who was telling the truth and ultimately they sided with Johnny Depp but what is what was it just him was it her or was it more him let's take a look at some of Johnny on the stand it's unfortunate that, that it's not only exposing for myself it's exposing for my family it's exposing for Miss her nor have I ever struck uh, um, any woman um, in my life. I thought that some human being had actually dropped a uh, <clears throat> grumpy, pardon the term, and they were yakking, they were yucking it up, they were laughing about the whole thing, and how do you fix that? <laughs> I did go back and re rewrite my journal to some degree. I, I took off the last two letters um, and had it say, why no forever? I slowly realized that you are in a relationship with your mother. <laughs> she threw the large bottle and it made contact and shattered uh, everywhere. And then I looked down and realized that the, the the tip of my finger had been severed. Um. Yes. Let's let him object to another one. <laughs> I was more inspired by Miss Heard to reach out for a numbing agent. I do not agree that I was very drunk on that flight. I don't recall drinking a whole, you don't need to drink a whole okay. hunt when you're on those things. You, uh, oh. you, you don't have time. Oh. Um, well, I don't feel you... like I'm wasting anyone's time. Passed out's an interesting way of putting it. Maybe asleep. It, it just seemed like a lot of word salad. And living with it for six years and waiting to be able to bring the truth out. I, I, I'll make it easy for Mr. Uh, Rotten Born. There was never a moment where I pushed Kate down any set of stairs. I'd never heard a rumor of that um, before um, Miss Heard. Sorry, I'm, I was drawn by Mr. Rottenborn's um, voice. Certainly. What, what was you like? Was it? It is me, but it's clearly. Your it's Honor, been, I didn't it's been, anything after that. No matter what happens. I did get here, and I did tell the truth. All right, let's talk about uh, Johnny. Was it Johnny or was it Amber that uh, made the jury say that Johnny was telling the truth? Let's bring back in Susan Constantine, also joining us in Los Angeles, forensic psychiatrist, trial expert, witness, and columnist, Dr. Carol Lieberman, and also in Southern California, forensic psychiatrist, Dr. Praveen Kambam, uh, good evening to all of you, and uh, thanks for your valuable time. Let's, uh, Carol, you, um, you've been very vocal, just like Susan, on, on where you think the deception has been. Was it that Johnny over just whelmed the jury with his charm and um, his slow talking, or was it that he just didn't give off that vibe that he might not be honest? That Amber did. What, it, overall, why did they choose Johnny over Amber? Johnny was real and you could feel his emotions. You know, he spoke rather slowly because he, because he, it wasn't because he was having processing difficulties, as Amber's psychiatrist uh, said about him. It was because each word to him was so important. He wanted to explain, he waited six years for this and he wanted to explain his truth 
Exactly, precisely. And, you know, it's interesting because um, in a way he was like the underdog. Now, you know, you wonder how could he be the underdog? He was had a lot more money than Amber. He was a lot more famous than Amber and so on. But he was being attacked by Mr. Rotten born <laughs> and that helped him you know the jury really uh, saw how how it wasn't a cross examination it was an attack and that went along with amber's attacks that we heard about on the tapes and so on the, uh, Praveen, do you do you uh, uh, agree with that was it did johnny win them over with did he seem authentic to you or was it just that he seemed um, more believable than amber yeah, I mean, I think there was lots of different factors here, but uh, from uh, what what it looks like the jury uh, keyed in on was maybe fit to a template that Mr. Depp's attorneys very um, astutely set up at the beginning. They set up a basically a template that, hey, this other witness on the other side, Miss Heard, she's not credible. You shouldn't believe her. And then everything that they did really undermine that. And so when you have, I, I saw on social media, at least if that's a proxy of how the jury would re uh, testimony is relatable, authentic, and they saw uh, Miss Miss testimony as maybe over dramatic or, or trying to sell too hard. And maybe that's a, a similar reaction that the jury had. Susan, um, the setting the table, uh, like Praveen said, that you know they bring in their expert. They say, "Yeah, this Amber lady is going to come up here, and when she does, keep in mind that according to our expert, she's not all there. She's got some some issues." Um, did that um, make a big difference here? In that now, when she was talking, jurors were maybe um, thinking differently than they did with Johnny because Johnny got to go first. Their expert got to go first, and 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 their expert actually um, was able to examine Amber Heard, which was huge. Well, I think that what you're talking about is a technique that's called anchoring. And when we heard the, you know, at the very beginning, and they're talking about um, Johnny Depp, you know, the stage was set, that they already had a predisposition about Amber, that she was out there, right? So that's a form of anchoring. So you've already kind of set the stage for what you would expect. But I want to trumpet both of your experts. They're spot on. We're in agreement. And what we look for when, you know, somebody is credible is that how does it emotionally move you as a person? When you think about going to the opera and you listen to someone saying and it brings you to tears, it moves you to feel that same emotion. The difference between Amber and Johnny, Johnny brought you in because it was authentic, it was real, it was raw. And yes, he was like the underdog that was being beaten up and people tend to rescue those that are being beaten up. And then we have Amber who comes in, you know, all guns blazing and she is aggressive, very aggressive in her tone, her demeanor, and even she's dressing in black, which is a color of a villain. I mean, why on earth? And I've said that before, you know, all of those things sends a picture, a movie of how a person is viewed the person, views another person by their demeanor and their appearances. No, yeah, good point. I guess I haven't thought about that. The, the other, um, you know, just the way she was conducting herself, but also the clothing and all that, I guess it all, you know, it all works in. You're the expert, you know this. Um, the, but you're right, it, it, um, they, were, they were just so different in the way they engaged and we weren't in the courtroom, which is different, but just watching it on television, it was a different experience watching them both um, tell their stories. And um, Johnny's uh, just style seemed to be more engaging. Let's take a break. When we come back, one of the most memorable witnesses to testify for Johnny Depp. What about the supporting casts, those other people that testified on behalf of each one of them? How important were they? Well, um, one of them, one of our favorites took to social media. You remember this guy? I like Ike, and so did everybody else. That's next.
didn't buy any paintings there. Instead, he offered me a complete patronship. So what did you understand he meant by um, becoming your patron? Well, he was going to financially make it possible for me to just paint every day and put together a body of work so that way then it could be sold. Did you take him up on that offer to live at the Eastern Columbia building? Yeah, of course. <laughs> and uh, how did that make you feel? I started crying. Is you know, one day, you, one day you're in your mother's garage selling paintings for a hundred dollars, two hundred dollars, three hundred dollars on eBay. Next thing you know, you you it's an art show, and like you don't have to worry about deadly squat. Of course, of course, uh, I was I was flipping out. When did you move into the Eastern Columbia building? The next day after we met and we talked. The next day. And here I am in front of this building. This is a beautiful building. This is like, you know, it's whatever, 13 floors, but it's like from the 1930s. Some Art Deco, beautiful building. And I'm looking, I'm going, all right, this is unreal. What, there's going to be, you know, all right, it's going to be one of these apartments or whatever, one of these places here. I go in with uh, Kevin Murphy. He takes me all the way up to the roof. We go, we go to, uh, into penthouse two, and this, I walk in, and I'm like crying, going, this is, a, it's beautiful. This is like a, a mansion uh, situation to me. We decided, okay, like 25 pieces of work, large scale, and, I, and Johnny says, hey, what, how long you think this will take? I said, I've never done it before. I don't know, maybe a few months. And were you able to comp complete the paintings in the in a few months? No, it's, it's after it took me to, to in order to make two large scale paintings. It took me like to almost two months. And did you develop a relationship uh, with the defendant in this case, Miss Hurd? Yeah. And did you get along with Miss Hurd? I loved her. I fell in love with her, just like Johnny fell in love with her. I fell in love with her. She's. Uh, uh, totally respectful, gracious to me, uh, that she's got great teeth, uh, that she treated me with complete respect. As I walked in, and she's in the kitchen at the counter, and she's doing a beauty facial mask, and uh, so she can't offer me. And I'm going, hey, is that something that can help me? And she looked at me, and she goes, no. <laughs> and that... And I'm laughing, and then she laughed after because she didn't realize she was making a joke. Johnny Depp's best friend and trial star Isaac Baruch Ike, they called him, made an impression, of course, during his time on the stand. He was one of the witnesses that may have helped push Depp, and, and like we talked about before, setting up that uh, scenario for Johnny to succeed. Um, he was uh, right there with the movie star throughout this. And not after the uh, verdict, he went to Instagram, did Ike, and he posted a message on his uh, platform saying, in part, I'm beyond the moon happy. Happy for my friend, his family, all his friends who have been there for him, the amazing team of lawyers who fought for our friend and especially kicked some royal bleep and revealed the truth of the matter so you could witness the evidence with your own eyes and ears. I'm also beyond happy for all the millions upon millions of people who have been there for this entire endeavor on this insane thing called the internet. Wow is all I can say. Your love for the truth and justice knows no bounds and I thank you for that. And I wanna say thank you for all of your loving friends and sharing your love with me. It's overwhelming so thank you, but thank you and yes, and this is the last thing he says. It's time to start painting, so Ike is going to start painting. Susan Constantine, uh, Carol Lieberman, and uh, Praveen Kambam are still with us. Praveen, to you first. When, when you have a witness like this, a person like this who can connect, and that's what he did, right? He connected with jurors in a way that others um, just simply don't, you, we don't have it in our DNA. Like, guys like this, they're just, they, they walk into a room and everybody smiles. How effective was he and in, in how important was he to this case early on, one of the first witnesses called? Well, remember, I mean, they're, they're looking at credibility. And one of the key factors with credibility for juries is likability. 
this guy is funny. He seems authentic. He talk, looks directly to the jury at times and he relates to them. Those are all very strong, strong things in a witness. And I think that that was a, a you said it exactly. It's, he connected with them. And I think that, that put him in a good position. Carol, your thoughts on Ike? Yes, I think he was, there are a lot of parallels between how he was and how Johnny was. You know, it's almost like he was a father figure to Johnny, you know. Um, not only did he, yes, he was funny and so on, but he was real. He didn't have, there was no self-consciousness about him. You know, Amber was super self-conscious. She put herself in a certain position and she, um, everything was deliberate uh, to the extent that she could control it. But, you know, he really, um, especially one of the things that was good that he said was he said, I loved Amber, you know, um, she was very nice. She was, uh, so it showed that he wasn't. He didn't get up there and he and, and start from the beginning to say, "Oh, she's this horrible person." But at the end, when he ended his his uh, testimony, he taught. He cried and he talked about how the, you know it hurt him all the more that um, she destroyed Johnny's family, and he he couldn't believe. You know, he said it was insane, which is interesting because that's the same word that Johnny used. You remember when when he was asked in his rebuttal, um, what do you think of all of this or how do you feel about all this? And he used the word insane. So they were really in sync. And um, and I think the jury was able to connect to uh, Isaac in a more, in a freer way, you know, without feeling like, oh, um, there's no, I shouldn't be so, I shouldn't like him so much because he's the, um, the plaintiff or, you know, what, what are the parties? Um, so really there were a lot of things. You know, another interesting fact is that when he told that story about uh, Amber having the, um, you know, saying that the facial uh, mask, or whatever, wouldn't help him. Um, the picture of Amber was very interesting. She had this smile and that was like the first real uh, emotion, you know, that we ever saw on her the whole trial. Yeah, she definitely, I mean, she was um, right there with the jury and everybody else. And uh, Susan, do we, can we learn a lot about a person by meeting their friends? Oh, yes. I mean, one of the things that I share with my clients when I'm working with them is that when they show up and they're on, you know, they're on the stand or they're going to be testifying. You know, when you're going to bring family members, they better mirror who you are because impression management is so important. So people that are around you, that surround you, your friends, your family are all a mirror image of who you are. And that speaks volumes. So filling the courtroom and having a witness like him standing up for Johnny Depp was really powerful because it shows you what types of people he does hang around. And here's a guy that, you you know, he doesn't strike me as a partier, doesn't strike me as someone that's been involved in drugs. I mean, he's just a genuine guy, right? Very likable. He makes me smile. Every time I see him, I immediately break into a smile. I go, this dude is so great. I'd love to meet him in person. And I think that's how everybody felt. And you could see even at an Amber Heard's table, even the, the attorneys were putting their hands over their face and they were smiling because it's like, this guy is great. And so that relationship building, the fact that he let everything down, and he was very unbiased. I mean, he's really all about what is mm -hmm. right, what is true, what is honorable. And it just showed big personality, big guy, big mm -hmm. heart, a big win. Yep, absolutely. Uh, something special. Susan Constantine, Dr. Carl Eberman, Dr. Praveen Kambam, thank you, all of you, uh, so much uh, for your valuable time on this Friday. Appreciate it. When we come back, we're going to update the murder, the murder, murder mystery saga. New developments today. We're, that's next.
code SUMMER at checkout. Tonight, in closing arguments, Johnny Depp walks away a winner from his U.S. defamation trial against ex-wife Amber Heard. But in 2020, he lost his U.K. legal battle. We take a look at the evidence that didn't make it in front of the jury in Fairfax, Virginia. Because I'm not answering him, I was looking out of the window, and he slaps my face. And I... It didn't hurt me. It didn't hurt my face. It just felt embarrassed. In Winter Park, Florida, former NBA executive Michael Redlick was found stabbed to death in his home in 2019. Now his wife and former stepdaughter, Danielle, is charged in his murder. We have a preview of the trial. Plus, Johnny Depp and Amber Heard both took the witness stand in their he said, she said defamation cases, but the jury ultimately believed Johnny's story. So tonight, we're asking you, the 13th juror, why do you think the jury didn't believe Amber? Buckle your seatbelts this hour of Closing Arguments starts right now. There, welcome back to Closing Arguments. I'm Ted Rollins. In tonight for Vidi Politan, we're going to begin the hour with the Murdoch murder mystery saga that just keeps getting more complicated, more bizarre. Today, officials with the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division announced that they sought and received permission from the Satterfield family to exhume the remains of Alec Murdoch's former housekeeper, Gloria Satterfield. Now, Gloria Satterfield died in 2018 in the Murdoch family home from what was described as a trip and fall accident on some stairs. Now, the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division said today they were, or they said months ago, they're going to open up a criminal investigation to, into her death. And then today, they have announced they're going to exhume her body. Now, earlier this week, Murdoch admitted in a confession of judgment filing that he, yes, he does owe the sons of the late housekeeper more than $4.3 million, basically admitting to the charges against him that he stole money from an insurance scheme using Gloria Satterfield's death. The question is, did she die of natural cause? Did she die of a fall? Or was something else going on? Let's get a little refresher on this complicated case, and to do that, let's bring in Court TV legal correspondent, Chanley Painter. We do believe that Mr. Murdaugh is a, uh, a danger. Um, he's, he's already, by the pre previous charges that he had, uh, he's been a danger to himself, and a man who's a danger to himself is a danger to others. Disgraced attorney Alec Murdoch was ordered held without bond after being arrested and charged with stealing millions of dollars in insurance money from the family of his longtime housekeeper. When a lawyer steals with a pen, it's just as bad as somebody who steals with a gun. Gloria Satterfield died after allegedly tripping and falling over the family dogs at the Murdoch, South Carolina home. Prosecutors say Murdoch came up with an elaborate scheme to sue himself, then steal money from her wrongful death settlement. At the time of his arrest, Murdoch was out on bond, facing charges that he tried to arrange his own death. Hampton County 911, where is your emergency? Yes, um, we're on... Sakahatchee Road, and uh -huh. there is a man on the side of the road with blood all over him, and he's waving his hands. He just laying there, waving his hands around? He looks fine, but it kind of looks like a setup, so we didn't stop. Oh, I don't blame you. Prosecutors say it was a setup that Murdoch tried to get this man, Curtis Eddie Smith, to kill him so that the Murdoch's surviving son, Buster, could collect $10 million in life insurance. Murdoch has been under a cloud of suspicion since his wife and another son, Paul, were found shot to death. His attorney admits his client may be guilty of financial wrongdoing, but insists Murdoch had nothing to do with the deaths of his wife and son. He says Murdoch called 911 after discovering their bodies in the family's hunting lodge. I've been up to it now. It's bad. Okay. Oh. Okay, and are they breathing? No, ma'am. Okay, and you said it's your wife and your son? My wife and my son. For nearly a century, the Murdoch name has embodied a legacy of power and justice in South Carolina's low country. Here in the small town of Hampton, it's virtually impossible to find someone who does not know of the prominent legal family. 
But recently, the name has become synonymous with tragedy. At the time of his death, 22-year-old Paul Murdoch was awaiting trial, charged with three felony counts of boating under the influence for a 2019 crash that killed 19-year-old Mallory Beach. According to depositions taken in that case, Paul Murdoch illegally purchased alcohol at Parker's convenience store using his older brother's ID. Surveillance video shows him leaving the gas station, towing his father's 17-foot boat. As he exits the store, you can see him raise his arms in a triumphant gesture to his friends. After attending an oyster roast, the six friends headed by boat to a bar in downtown Beaufort, South Carolina. And later, Murdoch stumbles on the dock as he and his friends return to the boat around 1 a.m. Just over an hour later, the boat slammed into a bridge piling. And Connor Cook called 911. What bridge is it? Paul, what bridge is this? Paul, what bridge? 911, where's your emergency? Hello? Police fire EMS. Hello? We're in a boat crash on Arthur Street. There's six of us and one is missing. The body of Mallory Beach was found nearly a week later in a marsh about five miles from the crash scene. The charges against Paul Murdoch were dropped after his death, but the investigation is ongoing. And again, the breaking news tonight is that uh, the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division has asked for and has received permission from Gloria Satterfield's family, that's the housekeeper who died at the Murdoch house, to exhume her body. Let's bring in the think tank tonight. Joining us in Atlanta, Georgia, criminal defense attorney Michael Bixon in San Diego, California, criminal defense attorney and former prosecutor Brian Watkins. And uh, you can always contact him at brianwatkinslaw.com. And in Cleveland, Ohio, criminal defense attorney Ian Friedman Good evening, gentlemen. Uh, Michael, to you first. This case, the uh, the Murdoch case, it's just every day. It's this onion that, that there's no censor to it. And uh, well, actually, there is a center. His name's Alec Murdoch. Uh, what what do you make of the ex exhuming Gloria Satterfield's body? They've already got him on bilking the family out of millions. He's admitted that. Um, what, what what do you think? What's your first instinct here when you hear that news? They think he killed her. I mean, it's that simple. Considering the amount of bodies that are piling up around this guy, considering the amount of financial crimes that are piling up around him, I'm not surprised in, in, the, in the least. I mean, you look at everything that's going around him, and I'd be shocked that they already had him, considering everything that's going on. So I mean, when you look at everything, you know, really not surprising. Uh, I think that obviously the, the autopsy is going to sort of let us in a little bit more information in terms of what might have happened. Um, we already know that he has signed over, what, $4.3 million, I think, considering that he had, you know, basically stolen this money from the family. Uh, so there's a lot of factors in here, and, and I'm, I'm not surprised in the least. Uh, Brian, as a quick refresher, when Gloria Satterfield died, Murdoch pulls the, the family aside and says, I'm going to get you some money, okay? We're going to work this out. I've hired, I want you to hire this lawyer. They think they're going to get maybe, you know, 50000 They don't get anything. Meanwhile, he cashes in 4.3 mil um, getting to the insurance, and it's his He's the guy, it was his house, it's his insurance company. The whole thing is disgusting. But now they want the body, um, if, if she fell, they're saying she fell down some stairs, unless there's a gunshot wound, um, I mean, what, what realistically um, are they gonna be able to find here exhuming the body? You know, that's a good question. I don't think they're gonna be able to find much. Clearly, when she was taken to the hospital immediately after the accident i'll say um you know the medical providers there looked at her body examined her body and determined it was a fall don't forget there's going to be medical records at the time that she was presented to the hospital with the injuries and so those injuries must be documented i don't know what else they're going to find 
you know, also because there's such a, a length of time between now and when the incident really happened, I don't know what they're going to find. You know, there's any allegations of poisoning or anything like that. I, you know, I don't know. Did she present with the injuries when she went to the emergency room immediately after the incident or didn't she? So I don't know what exhuming the body is really going to do. Yes, she did, actually. Uh, she had some uh, head trauma and then uh, some broken ribs. Uh, but Ian, it, it's, a, it's a far, you know, if, if someone pushed her down the stairs or if she fell down the stairs, how forensically can you determine that? So clearly, I think the family has a good faith basis to do this. With everything going on, they, like any of us, uh, would not settle for money if we felt that someone uh, took the life of our loved one, right? There's no amount of money. So here, I think what they're going to do is they, they've looked at the records clearly, like Brian said. They may not, at the time that the examination was done, look as in-depth as a forensic pathologist would. That's someone who's now going to come in and basically look at everything from head to toe under with kind of a different eye. Because before, there was really no suspicion that Murdoch or someone on his behalf may have done this. So they're not thinking like that. But now with everything else that's occurred, a pathologist is going to come in, look at the manner, the mechanism of death, and look to see, to determine whether or not this is consistent with kind of tripping over the dog, as was previously stated, uh, and so forth. So they're going to get an expert now to formulate an opinion. Whether that gives them just kind of the, the satisfaction of knowing or whether or not they want to bring this to the prosecutor's office, that's what we'll find out. Maybe difficult, but it's, this is going to be a far greater, far more complex and detailed examination than was likely done earlier. Yeah, and in the the folks at the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division has said it's going to take a long time. This is not a process that happens overnight. At the time that she fell, Gloria Satterfield, the person that called 911 was Maggie Murdoch, and now we know that she's dead, and Alec Murdoch is a potential suspect in her murder along with his sons. But let's listen to a, a bit of that 911 call made by Mrs. Murdoch after Gloria Satterfield fell down the stairs. My housekeeper has fallen and her head is bleeding. I cannot get her up. Okay, you said she's fallen. She's bleeding from the head? Yes. Okay. How old is she? I'm not sure, like 58 maybe. Do you know if she fell from standing or not? No. No. Where'd she fall from? Uh, uh, she fell going up the steps, up the brick steps. Okay, so she outside or inside? Outside. Okay. How many steps is there? Uh, eight. Okay, is she on the ground or is she up near the top? She's on the ground. She's on the ground. She's on the ground. Is she conscious? Uh, no, not really. Is she awake at all? Yes. Okay. Is she just not like responding appropriately, but she is awake? <laughs> Ma'am, she's not, no, she's not responding. Okay, I just, I, I've already got them on the way. Me asking questions does not slow them down, ma'am. Um, Knowing if she's conscious is one of the things that the medic needs to know if she's responding at really. all to you. No. Okay, so she's not responsive at all. Well, I mean, she's mumbling. Okay, so she is somewhat conscious. Michael Bixon, you listen to uh, Maggie Murdoch, and um, it I, who knows what people think when they're calling 911. Every, every call is different. What, what did you hear there? I mean, it's hard to judge someone just based upon a call like that. You know, everyone reacts to a different, you know, sort of emergency situation, I think, depending uh, on their own sort of character. Uh, you know, from that call, I wasn't able to glean that, you know, maybe she's in on it or maybe she had witnessed something, um, you know, and, and I certainly haven't heard any other evidence that she might be involved. So, I, you know, just based on that call, I, I'm not inclined to say that at least she's involved in anything so far. But Brian, though, uh, she then ends up dead along with her son. Um, theoretically, that could have been potential motive because, you know, if she knew things. And here's the other question. Do you think at the end of the day, a guy like Murdoch, now that we've heard all of these stories of the way he has stolen money uh, in, in bizarre different ways uh, throughout his years, do you think it, it's, it's possible that his, his wife and family didn't know or more po probable that maybe she did 
know something about his actions, the, the way he was conducting his life? Well, you know, if you're you're married to someone and they come home with four point three million dollars that they didn't have, uh, I think your wife's going to ask some questions. I don't care what kind of marriage you're in. I mean, that's going to raise some suspicions. Some questions are going to be asked. Hey, where did you get this money? The question is, is you know, is is he killing people to stop them from testifying or being witnesses? This seems to me a little far fetched. I would need to see a lot of evidence to substantiate a motive behind all these incidents. You know, I, I don't know. You know, clearly the boating incident is an isolated incident. To me, it seems like kids drinking on a boat, crash, someone gets hurt, totally. happens all the time. This is some bad, bad luck as far as befalling the family, but whether or not Murdoch's behind all of it, I don't know. At this point, there's not enough evidence for me to say that's the case. You know, clearly there's some financial problems there, but like I said, you know, killing her isn't going to take away that financial crime. Clearly, the financial crime, somebody has, you know, he has $4.3 million. People are going to come snooping around and say, hey, where'd you get that? Why do you have that? And things like that. So to me, I need a lot more information to be able to pass any judgment on this one. Yeah. Uh, Ian, you agree there that the family, and it's just too much, it's too much of a leap to think, oh, she sounded strange on the 911 call. Um, that's nothing, right? Yeah, no, I'm glad Michael said it, right? We, we can't judge how someone acts during a time of crisis. We all think we know how we'll act, but you don't know until you're in the situation. So there's a lot of evidence, a lot of cases, a lot of investigation here. This is one of those that I think any of us would be crazy to guess on. We're all going to find out in real time. Yeah, and when that happens, who knows? Uh, it's going to be a long process. It already has been a long process, but this is a case that uh, has fascinated people around the country. The more uh, you learn about it, the more uh, you just scratch your head and, and uh, wonder what was going on. Again, the breaking news today is the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division announcing that they have received permission from the Satterfield family to exhume Gloria Satterfield's body. Uh, she died back in 2018. We'll have more um, on this case over the next days, weeks, and probably months and years. After the break, did the missing evidence make or break the case for Amber Heard? That's what her side is saying. They're unhappy with the verdict. As that's a no-brainer. They're saying that they didn't get things in at trial, and had they, things would have been different. We'll talk about that next.
store, in-app, and online. In civil case number CL 2019-2911, Mr. Depp's claim against Ms. Hurd. One, as to the statement appearing in the online op-ed entitled Amber Heard, I spoke up against sexual violence and faced our culture's wrath. That has to change. In the Washington Post online edition, quote, I spoke up against sexual violence and faced our culture's wrath. That has to change, end quote. Do you find that Mr. Depp has proven all the elements of defamation? Answer, yes. There was uh, that moment when Amber Heard learned that she had lost her defamation case against uh, Johnny Depp, or he actually won his case against her. On Wednesday, of course, the jury did side with Johnny Depp on all three of his claims against Amber Heard. They had ended up awarding him $15 million in damages, which was reduced because of the law of the land, down to 10.3. And then uh, Amber Heard did pick up $2 million um, in one of her counterclaims. The verdict was a much different outcome than the 2020 UK trial where Johnny Depp sued the Sun newspaper for calling him a wife beater. He lost that one. Amber Heard's attorney, Elaine Bredehoff, did comment on the differences of the UK trial uh, for their team. We were hoping to, tonight we were gonna analyze her interview with Chanley Painter that she was gonna have this afternoon and then she, um, I guess had something come up, bailed at the last minute, but uh, she did talk about the differences between the two cases on the Today Show this week. We had an enormous amount of evidence that was suppressed in this case that was in the UK case. In the UK case, when it came in, Amber won, Mr. Depp lost. Some of the evidence not allowed in the U.S. trial included text messages following that flight from Boston to Los Angeles that both Johnny Depp and Amber Heard testified about. So, for TV's Julia Janae dug into that evidence and has more. Another perspective of the Boston plane incident was never seen by the jury. Documents obtained by Court TV reveal text messages exchanged just after that controversial trip. Exhibit number 229, entered as evidence in the libel case in the United Kingdom, was barred as hearsay from the Virginia trial. This text from Depp's phone to his then wife, Amber Heard, reads, once again, I find myself in a place of shame and regret. My illness somehow crept up and grabbed me. Heard alleges Depp kicked her during a vicious fight on that flight to Boston in May of 2014. I feel this boot in my back. He just kicked me in the back. No one said anything. No one did anything. It was like you could hear. You could hear a pin drop on that plane. You could feel the tension, but no one did anything. Depp denies ever physically assaulting his partner. I'm like sorry, he's rat. sorry, he feels bad, yes, because any other answer, you know, uh, uh, it would turn into World War III. Heard's attorney aimed to discredit the movie star by presenting text messages like this one from Depp's personal assistant, Stephen Duders, to Amber Heard. It reads, hey, he's up. He's much better, clearer. He doesn't remember much, but we took him through all that happened. He's sorry, very sorry. Later, Duders writes, Depp was appalled. When I told him he kicked you, he cried. You asked Mr. Duders to communicate with her on your behalf, correct? Um, I don't know what you're talking about. After the Boston plane flight, you had Mr. Duders communicate with Miss Hurd, correct? When I'm asked what to do, I said placate her, just placate her like we always do. Duders never testified, so with Depp on the witness stand for the second time, here's what happened when Amber Hurd's defense attorney tried to show those texts from Depp's assistant to the jury. Your Honor, I I think you know where I'm going here, and based on Mr. Depp's testimony, I'd ask him for the admission of Exhibit 229. Your Honor, I'd, can we please be sure. sure? After that sidebar, attorney Ben Rottenborn moves on, and those texts stay out of evidence. I knew that she would say that. I mean, I knew that she would say that she had issues with 
you know, him with drugs and alcohol. Depp's sister, Christy Dombrowski, who testified and sat in the gallery for closings, also fired away messages to her about the Boston incident. She urged the couple to work things out. Could be things get better from all of this. I want to help you both. Heard responds, sounding defeated. I'm not going to keep falling back into the same patterns that always repeat themselves. If he truly gets help, then I hope he would come to find me. Meanwhile, in a separate string of texts, Depp's messages sound first remorseful, then indignant that Heard hasn't returned his call. I'm out. I'm done. Her actions have added more drama than necessary. And when was I unhealthy exactly? When I was not sober for a day? I guess that's what people call falling off the wagon. It's happened to a lot of my friends. Their wives don't stop calling them. All right, let's talk about the uh, difference that these texts might have made and the evidence that was excluded from this trial uh, might have made. Bring in the think tank, Michael Bixon, Brian Watkins, and Ian Freeman. Ian, to you first, this, the text, specifically the one that Stephen Duders wrote to Amber Heard that said, when I told him he kicked you, he cried. If, if that gets in, does, is this a, a different outcome, possibly? Possibly, it could be. I mean, it, it's one part of it. But keeping it out under those circumstances, the objection was based upon the fact that Stephen Duders wrote those. He wasn't called. They could have subpoenaed him. And we all know you have to follow the rules of evidence. It would be hearsay to put those in. And perhaps they didn't even lay the proper foundation or authenticate the messages. There could be a whole host of reasons that it didn't come in, more than one. So, you know, you can complain about it now and, and say, yeah, maybe it would have made a difference. But if you had the opportunity to do it and you didn't do it correct, that's on you. And of course, any party who loses is going to be upset. And we hear all the time that parties go in to exercise their appeal. Just like here in the trial, you have the right to the trial, you have the right to appeal. These things will all be raised. And, uh, you know, we'll see if, if the judge uh, improperly excluded them or if the parties, they themselves, were at fault uh, for not doing what was necessary to get those messages in. Brian, there were a lot of witnesses that you, um, you listen to Amber Heard tell her story and you're like, oh, just got to go get that flight attendant who uh, you gave the ecstasy to, or you go going to get that girl at the campfire that Johnny was going to break her arm, or how about Steven Duders, who apparently saw you get kicked in the back? None of them showed up. Uh, why do you think that took place? Uh, should they have not dragged them there, um, regardless if they wanted to be or not? If they could. The problem with Amber Heard's case is their lawyers don't understand that she wasn't believable. And the fact that she couldn't back up anything that she said is why they lost, let alone other little features like, you know, her looking at the jury while telling these emotional events. If you've ever looked at someone, any trial where it's clear that a person was victimized. That's not even the question. The question is who did the victimization? A person who was hurt in some extreme way, when they tell their story and they're crying, they don't look at the jury. They look down, they cry, they stare right at the lawyer as they relive that event. That's a person who's really telling the truth. Not a person who takes a question from the lawyer, turns to the jury and starts crying as she tells a story, then stops crying, looks at the lawyer and says, okay, what's your next question? I mean, so to say six weeks of trial, they put on evidence and for the lawyer to say that this one little text message where Johnny Depp doesn't admit anything would have turned the whole trial is kind of silly to me. You had six weeks to present your case. You did it. You put on a lot of evidence. It wasn't enough. Clearly that one little sentence from somebody else saying something about Johnny isn't going to change the tide. Okay. I know where you stand on all of this, Brian. Uh, we're going to step aside <laughs> and take a break. When we come back, another big trial we're tracking here at Court TV, Florida versus Danielle Redlick. Uh, and this one is a doozy. Uh, jury selection is starting next week in the Sunshine State. We'll preview this case. Wait till you hear the details.
I believe my husband is deceased. I, I just, he's stiff and he's he didn't want it. He might have had a heart attack. I don't know. Did you just find him? No, actually. It happened last night. Welcome back. That was a 911 call placed by Danielle Redlick, a woman accused of the death of her husband back in 2019. Michael Redlick, a former NBA executive for the Memphis Grizzlies, was found dead in his Winter Park, Florida home. Redlick's wife, Danielle, called police to report his death, but not until 11 hours after he was fatally wounded after an argument. Danielle initially, as you heard there, claimed that eh, I think he might have had a heart attack, but then uh, changed her story when questioned by the 911 operator. He was not okay last night. We had we had altercation, and he stabbed himself. And I ran in the bathroom, and then when I came out, I was trying to help him, and I saw he was just lying in blood. And then okay. I tried to help him, and I couldn't. Him. Daniel Red, uh, Redlick told investigators the couple that had that argument and, and, and that somehow Michael stabbed himself. Turned out he stabbed himself a bunch of times. Detectives learned that the couple had a tumultuous relationship with constant fights about infidelity and dating apps. Complicating things a little further, Michael Redlick was once Danielle's stepfather. Yes, Danielle's mother, Kathleen, was married to Michael Redlick she died of cancer after her death. Danielle and Michael fell in love and got married. Despite their 20-year age gap, Danielle Redlick faces second-degree murder and also tampering with physical evidence. If convicted, she could spend, of course, the rest of her life in a Florida prison. A think tank still with us. Michael Bixon, Brian Watkins, and Ian Friedman. Michael, did, this is a, whew, it's, it's a crazy, crazy story. Um, the the fact that she's told he may have had a heart attack oh wait he stabbed himself a bunch of times because we got in an argument um 911 calls go a long way do they not at trial oh absolutely and especially when you're talking about inconsistencies like this at first maybe it was a heart attack but then he stabbed himself and not just stabbed himself but stabbed himself multiple times with multiple knives i believe actually that's not great um, I mean, for any defense, you know, for any defense attorney, you go, "Ooh, that, that's not the best case I've heard." Um, now, you know, I, I certainly hear that, you know, uh, she's claiming that it was self-defense now, but even that is another problem because that's inconsistent with what she first called in as well. And so, I, I definitely think they have a, a uphill battle ahead, to say the least. Ian, it, does the um, he used to be my stepdad, and then he turned into my husband? Um, <laughs> is that just a red herring that might come out at trial that the defense? might kind of try to use in a weird like manipulative way he that she was a prisoner for for years um and that she, then boom she snapped well the defense is definitely gonna have to come up with something novel like that i don't know if that's it because uh, it's not the greatest place to start when anyone hears it unfortunately they, they're gonna look at her and and him and say what kind of folks are these it's not a good place they make it makes it more hard for jurors to relate to them so it's not a good fact you know michael brings up the the fact the importance of the 911 no doubt about it but here the problem as i see it is she claims self defense and the stabbing and so forth what happened after that though is going to be Ted, just as difficult as kind of that fact about the you know what the familial relationship was to him you know usually obviously i always look we all look right to the camera but there's so much here if we if you look at the arrest warrant in this case that was done by the arresting officer they state and again now this is just the police saying it the defense we don't know their case we don't know how they're going to challenge it but if this is what it is if these are the facts even after challenging evidence of her cleaning the blood with towels bleach mopping removing his clothing saying she did cpr when the hospital shows that there was no uh, evidence of that whatsoever no uh, evidence of the knife wound being self-inflicted uh, bruises elsewhere to his body she stated uh, uh, there were no text messages as she had reported she said well he and i were texting before those weren't there it goes on and on. Here's what really bothers me. And it, it, this almost circles back to what you were saying about the relationship and how jurors are going to look at her. The forensic uh, analysis of her phone showed that 
two hours before she dialed 911. So this is nine hours uh, after time of death. She was online on a dating site called Meet Mindful. That to me is gonna be something that if that's true and if the defense doesn't have some explanation for that, that shows her to be cold hearted. I think that one's gonna be really hard to get by. And I just wanna say one last thing, one sentence that's really gonna come in throughout this. All the witnesses who are talking about the history of violence and the turbulence between these two, they've testified as it's set forth in the arrest warrant that the deceased several times over the course of the relationship said, yeah, I'll get back with her as long as I hide the steak knives. You can't make this stuff up. Yeah, um, Brian, opening statement should be very entertaining because that's what we're gonna get a little bit of a clue on what they've concocted for a defense. You know, it, it shocks me to know that <clears throat> nine hours, it, you know, since the death of the 911 call, and that's what she came up with, nine hours? She tries to clean the blood and she calls 911 with a story like that? It, it blows my mind. And the problem with it is, is this has to be a self-defense case. You know what the problem with the self-defense case is? Your defendant has to testify. Doesn't seem like she's gonna be a good witness. And that's gonna be a huge problem for the defense. She will have to testify, uh, Michael, one would think, because um, you know th it's gotta be one of those, um, uh, yes, I lied, I did it, I did it, and but here's why, and here's how it really happened. I'm telling the truth this time. Um, and to pull that off, it's, it can be near impossible. Oh, absolutely. And, and like I said before, the biggest problem are the inconsistencies in her statements. They will grill her if she takes that stand. I, I, I'm pretty confident in saying that they will tear her apart. So, you know, you take what you, what you, what you got and maybe it's a self-defense case, but, you know, I can't imagine that it's going to be a great one. Yeah, we're going to find out. We're going to find out soon. Danielle Redlick's trial is set to begin this coming Monday, June 6th, with jury selection expected to last up to three weeks. Our cameras will be there, and it'll be our next live trial right here on Court TV. Also on Monday, tune into Court TV at 9 a.m., where we'll continue our coverage of the Beauty Queen murder trial. Ryan Duke stood trial for the murder of Tara Grinstead in Osceola, Georgia. Going on at the same time as the Johnny Depp trial, we were there as well, and we're replaying it for you. It's fascinating. Uh, you won't believe the ending. After the break, we ask you this question. Why do you think the jury didn't believe Amber Heard? Those responses next when our 13th juror speaks.
There's cash back in everything you buy. These statements are used over and over and over and over again online to reverberate, re-echo, uh, and re-energize. Objection, Your Honor. This is not responsive. Lack of foundation. It's and hearsay. Right. She gets to give her consent for it. Well, her emotional, the question was, what your emotional impact of these statements? Okay. The impact it has on me is every time I look at it, uh, which is every day. I am set back. I have to relive it. I have to, to ha have my, the worst, most painful things I've ever gone through, painful memories I've ever had, the things I've narrowly survived at times, embarrassing, intimate details that I never wanted to be known never wanted to be public ever and to have them used every single day to call me a liar. I have to relive this every single day that I have to address those claims. Over and over again, the most intimate, embarrassing, deeply humiliating and personal things that I've survived are used against me every day. Over and over again, it's torture. It's so, I'm in so much pain emotionally. I'm, I, I just wanted him to leave me alone. I wanted to move on with my life. And he won't let me. By making statements like this, he won't let me. Welcome back. Time for the 13th jury. We asked you, why do you think the jury in this case did not believe Amber Heard? Our comment of the day comes from Chrissy. Her accounts were highly over-exaggerated and so extreme with minimal evidence to back anything up. No medical records, no police history, no credible witnesses, nothing. The only reliable evidence presented that made sense were those audio snippets. The photos were questioned and proven to be altered. The accounts between witnesses didn't match up with her own testimony, which oftentimes her own testimony didn't match up to her previous testimony. She plays blame everywhere, but at her own doorstep Michael Bixon in Friedman Brian Watkins Brian to you first um, what do you think was it uh, your reaction to Chrissy's comment Chrissy hits it the nail right on the head she's absolutely 100% right they didn't back up anything that she said the way that she said it was very unbelievable and here's her main problem is and that she lied about things that she didn't have to lie about such as, I suffered up $100 million in damages from this. You didn't. You didn't suffer $100 million for damages. That's an exaggeration. And so now we know that you're an exaggerator and we have to take everything you say with a grain of salt. Another thing, oh, I wasn't even talking about Johnny. Yet you put six weeks of evidence on about what Johnny did to you. Why didn't you put on evidence of the other boyfriend who you were talking about? So these things were very obvious to the jury and then everything else she says, gets very good scrutinized, and she wasn't able to back any of it up. So I think Chrissy hit the nail right on the head. Well, what does Kathy say? She says Amber didn't own up to any of her behavior. Johnny made himself vulnerable and believable by owning his behavior, not denying it. Uh, and Michael, that is one thing. You know, he, uh, he had to admit to some, some bad behavior, some horrible texts with Paul Bettany and the drug use and the drinking um, and the temper tantrum that we watched on video. Um, your take. I agree in part and I disagree in part. I, I do think that one of the big issues is that she just wasn't believable. And I think that she came off as a professional witness, which is not good in a case like this. I think for her, that was probably the biggest issue in terms of not making herself, you know, and like I said, agree in part, sort of that, that vulnerability that we saw from Johnny Depp. But I think part of that was really because she came off as, like I said, a professional witness and not what the jury was really looking to hear. All right, this comes from Julie. Apart from inconsistent stories from Amber Heard, and she's always denied the ACLU article wasn't about Johnny Depp, but then she admitted it was, the leaks to the media and press, et cetera. There is such a thing as overacting, and we all saw it. Johnny Depp came across as sincere, believable, and Amber Heard did not. Ian, did this come down to an acting contest? I don't want to go out and say that uh, they were acting, right? They went up there, supposedly told their truth, but those jurors had to make that uh, determination. 
And I will say that when someone is looking you right in the eyes, you could tell a lot of truth. But if you if they believe that you're looking them straight in the eyes, as she was, as Michael was saying, she's looking right at them, and she tells a lie that was completely, very, whether it was the makeup kit, the lack of injuries, whatever it was. You know, I always say to jurors, how many lies do you have to tell before you're considered a liar? And if you're a liar, how can anything you say be believed? And she was doing it, looking at them the whole time. So obviously the jury, I don't know if they felt she was acting or just not a credible, I don't know what the tag is. She just wasn't believable. Alan says it's so very obvious and supported by evidence that she lied about basically everything under oath in three continents. She kept changing her story and lying. I followed this case for four years and it's so great to see he finally got justice. His story never changed because it's true. Michael, um, that changing story, there's parts, uh, there, there were um, events that came out at this trial that were new, accord, you know, that didn't come out before because um, they were added in uh, specifics, parts of the bottle story, there, the, these types of things that if you had been following it for years, as, as this person did, um, that, and another little, that's another issue, is it not? But I'll ask you this, do you think there's some truth in all of her stories and that it was just exaggeration? I mean, usually there's some truth to, you know, both stories. I, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised that there, you know, that there were the truthful elements to it. How much of it was is obviously hard to say. I think with more corroboration, it certainly would have helped. And we talked about the witness issue earlier. Um, but I, I do think that there were truthful elements. You had, I doubt that all of it was a lie, certainly. With my head in the clouds, 20, that's a nice name, says her constantly looking at the jury. Plus the famous, tell them, I, Johnny Depp, blah, blah. That was it. That was enough. Um, uh, Ian, that was a big moment, was it not? When you have someone on audio saying those words. Yeah, it doesn't help, right? I mean, it was there on tape. And, and as uh, what that viewer just said, looking right at them, trying to make contact, trying to convince them of the truth of these things that just you're hearing it in the privacy of their lives. It was real to those jurors. It meant a lot to those jurors. It certainly swayed all the fans that were watching this from around the world, all the court viewers and so forth. Sure, it was powerful. And then you take it in conjunction with all the other pieces of powerful evidence here. It just didn't make for a credible uh, story. All right, uh, thanks to Michael Bixon, Ian Friedman, and Brian Watkins uh, for your valuable time on a Friday night. Hope you all have a wonderful weekend. Appreciate it. Uh, now, time for uh, you to take a look. They need your help. Uh, there's a missing child tonight. His, uh, her name is Imani Singleton, missing since May 25th. Missing from New York, New York. Date of birth, February 1st, 2007. Um, she's 15 years old, and um, she's missing. And if you uh, know of, of her whereabouts, she's 150 pounds. Look, uh, call New York Police Department, 1-212-694-7781 or 1-800-THE-LOST. That's it for us uh, tonight. Appreciate you uh, hanging out with us on this Friday evening. Appreciate Vinny letting me sit in for him tonight. Have a great weekend.